jobs inside jails, including education. There are plans to outsource three quarters of the current teaching positions in prisons to training organisations. The teachers' union has labelled it a cost-cutting measure aimed at replacing university-qualified education officers with cheaper staff. However, the Minister for Corrections says the teachers are too focused on subjects like music and art and prisoners need vocational training to prepare for real jobs when they leave jail. Late Line's John Stewart spoke with former bank robber and prisoner John Killick about how he learnt to write in prison and one of the teachers who helped him. Fancy bumming into you oh, down here. What are you doing down in Sydney? Oh, I've come to see you. It's great to see you. It really is. It is. <laughs> you look terrific, too. Thanks. I mean, when I first came into jail, when you met me, I was. Absolutely, persona non grata. So. You were a terrible embarrassment well, you, <laughs> to you, the department. Well, you couldn't get near me. You, nobody could get near me. No, and, uh, no. and if it wasn't for you coming down with that little trolley and, and saying, "Look, would you like some books?" Because I couldn't get to the library, couldn't do any, I couldn't get an education. And I, I think, you know, truly, you helped keep me sane. You know, I got some great books. And the guy next to me got Sorry. Harry Potter, and uh, <laughs> he said, I got Harry Potter, and I said, well, I got Bonfire of the Man, and he's Thomas <laughs> Wolfe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I spent four years in segregation over that escape and uh, that's a long time to be in segregation when most of the time you're locked up 23 hours a day. If any you had a kid in jail, it's, it's, it's not another criminal, it's, it's, uh, it's boredom. Getting into segregation was fraught but, <laughs> and everything had to be passed through officers and um, I, I knew what John liked after getting to know him, I knew what sort of books that he would like or what supplies and I would take a whole range of stuff there. When I came out of segregation, she'd come around the yards, there'd be 50 guys in the yards, they'd all see Bunny, she'd come along with a little trolley, she'd have these things. She'd never knock anybody back to She'd give them all the writing pads, she'd give them the pens, she'd give them everything she had. And they'd ask her for things and, and she'd try and get it for them. Education is something for the future. From the lowest literacy levels, some of them want to write letters to their children and that's a motivation to come to education to the to people who want to do a university courses. You've got to look at it that you're in jail. Your state of mind it has to be, well look, can I do anything about this? No, I can't. I'm, I'm in jail for a long period of time or whatever the time might be. Can I do something constructive with this time? And you can sit there and waste that time and just vegetate or you can do something constructive. Now, the only way to really do anything constructive, in my opinion, is to do educational stuff, you know, uh, to, to do courses to self-improvement. I've had some criticism from officers who say, why do you waste time on that scum? Or, and I'd say, well, it's helping you manage them while they're here, you know. Um, they've got a lot of time here. They may as well be utilising their time in the most productive way, which is learning. It was an escape that stunned prison guards with its audacity. This is the first time in Australia's history that this sort of escape has happened. This is a very daring, almost Hollywood-style uh, escape. Police say 30-year-old Lucy Dudko chartered a helicopter for what was supposed to be a joy flight over the Homebush Olympic site. She then asked for a closer look at nearby Silverwater Jail. And she said, can we go any lower? And I said, no, we couldn't go any lower. And uh, I must have looked away a little bit and looked back to see her pulling her, uh, a pistol out of her purse. I ran to it and got in and they fired three shots at it. Somebody fired three shots at it and uh, two of them hit the chopper. We, we were very lucky. John, how many bank robberies did you do in your lifetime? Well, I've always said only the ones that I was caught for. You know, that's all you really you can say, isn't it? How many times did you escape and how many times did you attempt to escape? Well, I, I, I attempted five times. Um, I, I was successful three times. And 
um, two unsuccessful escapes. Why were you driven to keep trying to escape? Depression can seep in, in a lot of different ways. Um, with me, the only way I was able to, to fight off that depression was to say, well, I'd look around and say, well, I'm going to get out of here. That, that was my mindset. Dad was a totally different personality when he drank. It's like all of us, I think we've all got two sides and the alcohol brought out the other side in him. And when he drank, he was violent. He was a nightmare of my childhood. We would hide under the house in the middle of winter sometimes because he was in a drunken rage. We'd walk the streets at four o'clock in the morning with my mother. I'd lie in bed praying that he'd get arrested for drunkenness so he wouldn't come home. Well, my mother overdosed on sleeping tablets. It was probably intentional, and we'll never know. We couldn't get her to hospital in time, and she died. You know, it's, uh, and I left home that day. I blamed my father for what happened. She was depressed, but we didn't recognise depression in those days. It wasn't diagnosed. The flashing light, and they're on their way. In Melbourne in 1966, I lost $4,000 at the tab in one afternoon. That's equivalent to over $70,000 today. You, you imagine the impact on your mind if you walk into a tab one afternoon and lost $70,000 when you haven't got that sort of money. You know, if you're Kerry Packer, uh, you just wouldn't bat an eyelash. But when it's, you're just an ordinary guy, that uh, you know that, hell, I got to rob a bank on Monday to get that back. That's the way my attitude was then. So. You know, gambling was very destructive to me and, and my relationships. And I would say that probably most reasons that I, that I went to jail was through gambling, w without a doubt. You're making too much noise, right? You're not, no, you're making too much noise. No, come on. Stop it. Come on. No. <laughs> As a scheduled date of Ryan's execution drew near, there was a straight-wide protest by all class of people in an effort to save his life. Most writers don't write for money. Most writers write because they want to write, they've got something to say, they want to get it out there. I have seen some inmates who have completed degrees completely in their cells with very limited resources, the best that we could do, and handwriting their essays, sending them off as, as best as they could, and receiving, you know, high distinctions <laughs> and it, it was just so satisfying to see see them doing so well and, and such determination. I, I think everybody's got a got a book in them. You know, I've, I've, just about everybody I meet, I talk to them, if I get to know them, I think you've got a book in you, you know. And I think they know it themselves. Yeah, well, I have got a book in them. It's a matter of getting it out, you know. That's all from us for tonight. You can find all of late.